we do live in a culture that is extremely fat phobic. You know, we are very much um, leaned and um, conditioned to say thinness is better. Thinness is more attractive. It's more desirable. Welcome back to Off the Cuff. I'm your host, Danny Priori, and today my very special guest is Alicia McCullough. Alicia is a millennial licensed clinical mental health therapist, say that three times fast, and the owner of Black and Embodied Counseling and Consulting, PLLC. Alicia, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good today, actually. You've got some good overall weather. It's still cold, but it feels good over here. How about for you? Uh, doing well you know you get that post-holiday lull a little bit you know yes absolutely. you know you get, you, you get the you know what it is it's like you get all up for christmas you're super yep. hype and then your your body like shuts down after yes exactly that it's like you're like working up to it and then your body's like okay i'm offline now yes yes so it's like i'm off the grid right now as much as possible but yeah. um so th the first question first thank you so much for coming and spending some of your valuable time with us um, but the first question I wanted to ask is when it comes to being a millennial licensed clinical mental health therapist, see, I, I keep saying, cause I want to be able to say that as fast as possible at one point, what kind of studying and what kind of, uh, but because I feel like mental health stuff, right. Especially in school curriculum, it's always evolving, right? Yes. So for for it to be millennial, what kind of changes have you seen made throughout the curriculum? Yeah, that is an amazing question. When I think about the way current mental health um, curriculum or uh, treatment is structured, it still really aligns with a lot of the old age, um, westernized uh, ways that it was created. And so in my experience, there hasn't been a lot of like diversity or um, really any deviation from that um, that way of that treatment model and that um, modality. And so what I've noticed is that even me being a millennial in this space, that that's been the thing that has um, allowed for me to be able to connect with clients in a different way. Also being a millennial, um, I came up in a time where there wasn't technology in the way that it was now. And then I was able to be a part of that digital age being brought into it. And so I think that like, for example, with the pandemic, um, even moving and doing virtual therapy, we probably never would have thought we'd be doing therapy over Zoom or a telehealth platform. And so I think just that ability to be able to adapt and, you know, um, move with the current current events that are happening is a huge skill set that I think being a millennial really affords me. And so when I think about the way that I do therapy, I view it from that more updated lens, constantly keeping up to date with the way the trends and the way that, you know, the world is evolving and bringing that into the room as well i'm 33 i'll be 34 in january mm -hmm. so it was like we were kind of the last era of you remembered all your friends like house phone numbers and stuff exactly yes <laughs> you know like uh and to see the evolution has been um you know crazy to even think about and then like i start to think about my parents like these people saw like the first like color television exactly so it's like Oh, it's so crazy. It's so crazy to think about what kind of pushed you towards this field. Was it something that you were passionate about as a child? Uh, was there a specific event that happened in your life? You were like, you know what, this isn't right. I need to help with this. Or was it something that, you know, because sometimes things just happen out of nowhere, right? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, like every everybody's ethos and in, in genesis uh genesis is different. You know what I mean? So yes. like for you, what was what was the driving force in uh your pursuit of this uh profession? Absolutely. So for me, I um found that I love talking to people. And so I'd, you know, have phone conversations with friends for hours and hours, and they'd end the conversation and say, I feel so much better, or it was so good talking to you. And so I had this um almost very um I would say underdeveloped um, idea around what therapy meant. And so I was like, oh, well, I'll just like, you know, be a therapist. I just want to talk to people. I just want to help people, you know, like what most people who go to school to study psychology might say. Um, and then I got into the actual psychology field and was like, wow, you know, like these are, there are actually, you know, disorders or there's names for, you know, what people are experiencing. And I think that was different for me because what I was experiencing on the day to day, 
there was no names for those things, for anxiety or depression or family issues. It was just that these were just normal things as a part of being in the community. And so I think like being in mental health, that was when I got the language. That's when I really quite honestly didn't even see myself as someone in need of mental health or didn't even think about mental health until I got to graduate school and was studying counseling, which is really interesting because mm. I studied psychology in undergrad and I just didn't see myself in that um, in the field because there was no representation. And so it took until I became like a therapist and started that training where I finally was like, oh, actually these are things I've experienced. They just might look different or there's more context or there's the cultural pieces. But I think that was really the driving force. And that's when I said, I want to also then bring that culture into the work I'm doing with clients. And so, you know, I am very thoughtful about you know, the holistic person that's showing up in the room, their history, you know, the culture, the social context, all of that really is important in thinking about um, how treatment goes or how healing goes for them. I think what you what you do is uh, very, very important. I'm going to get into why. Um, and for me, I feel that when you hear about therapy being studied in colleges, right, um, mm -hmm. you know, you know, it, there's all kinds of studies that you see in college, right? You see Native American studies, you see Af African studies, yeah. but that's all just kind of a uh, a singular scape. You know what I mean? Yeah. You don't really think of mental health as a race thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, especially when it comes to, you know, they teach you basic like, you know, um, psych, psych 101. Right. Um, have, have you seen in your time in the field now, uh, schools actually pushing for curriculum of how to actually treat certain, you know, uh, certain diagnosis in different races? And have you seen anything, uh, you know, in the analytics of where there are fundamental differences? Yeah, so I think that's an amazing question. And Danny, I think you really framed it well when you were first talking about just you go to psychology and you don't think, that race or gender or class or any other social identity would be, you know, a driving point. And I think that speaks to the way that the field, you know, has normed one experience, you know, of mental health. And so we don't think that there are other experiences outside of that, which I think speaks to why I didn't see myself represented there, you know. I will say in a lot of the programs that, um, are you know PWI programs, which for folks that might not know, predominantly white institutions. Um, I think those programs are still catching up um, to thinking about diversity or thinking about you know social identity and how treatment models look different. I think for uh, programs that might be like minority based or HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, that those programs are heavily based in like, um, you know, whether that's black studies or, you know, some other thing. And so I think that it really does depend. And I really would like for more programs to incorporate and integrate those other lenses into the treatment, because I think that's what helps us work with different people. Like when we're just using this one format, that might not be helpful for everyone, you know? And so I think having that background and having these other, you know, tools and skills is what really helps bring the work to life with the person you're working with that does have a different background than you. So I do, I would like to see more of it, but right now I think that we're still um, a bit behind, you know, in certain institutions. For sure. And then, you know, a lot of it I think about too is, especially in America, um, you know, the more and more time goes on, the more and more mixed, mixed race children, yes. uh, you know, the, yes. the, the, you know, there's going to be a whole generation where everybody's mixed at some point. Mm -hmm. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just how it is. Um, so for children though, do you think that in schools that have like guidance counselors and stuff, guidance, should guidance counselors have representations from all walks of life in terms of, you know, um, because, you know, kids are more and more like advanced than ever. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. you know, whether, whether, whether a child is trans, um, yeah. whether a child is fat, uh, skinny, whether a child is, uh, you know, like th there's so many different things that certain kids, uh, you know, might need counseling for growing up. And it's almost like, I, I feel this way. 
I would almost want somebody that represents me to help me in a sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I think it is important that even as people are hiring, like, I think this is where it gets into more of the structural or systemic pieces around, you know, when people are hiring, making sure that their staff is representative of the body that they're the student body that they're working with, you know, um, because it is important to see someone that, you know, might hold, like you said, a trans identity and you're going through something at school and you're like, I'm the only person here that's experiencing this, or I'm being bullied, you know, because of this identity. And then you have this person you can go through to as a safe space that says, Hey, I've been there with you. You know, I understand this experience and can talk through it. And it's not just for the folks that hold that identity, but I think it helps normalize normalize the experience even within the school system for folks that mm. might not hold that identity it makes it more normal to say hey like people just exist like this and it doesn't always have to be like um they're the for example they're the black person here it's that this is the guidance counselor here or this is right. the, this person here right so i think it helps even normalize the positions by having different representation correct me if i'm wrong but obviously the the trauma that uh you know black people have ha gone through in this country is obviously you know if you opened a book in the last uh you know 200 years i would hope yes. that you know that black people have been through some shit yes um, <laughs> and um you know i used to have i used to have friends in school and i would be like you know like maybe like you want to go talk to the guidance counselor and they would just be like yeah like i'm not talking to some white lady yes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's real and, yeah, and I never really thought about like I I remember just being like, oh, but like she's a guidance counselor. Yeah. And they uh, you know, my friend, my friend who uh who was black, he was like, I'm not gonna go talk to some white lady. Yes. And mm -hmm. I never really put like two and two together till I got a little bit older. Yes. Um and you know, the more and more we do this show, we talk to people of all walks of life on here, but you know, in predominantly black neighborhoods, mental health has just been a very difficult uh topic to uh bring up yes um, and especially amongst the black black males too yes uh, you know statistically and then for you though what was the experience like for you growing up like in terms of if you needed help with someone did you feel feel more comfortable like talking to a person of color or like you didn't really care because i never yeah. really thought about it until i got older and i was like damn like I didn't understand what he was saying at the time, but I feel him now because there's yes. a lot, there's a disconnect there. Absolutely. I personally also, you know, relate to your friend in that I didn't feel comfortable going to my guidance counselor. And I'll say that for a variety of reasons, I think she was a white woman, um, but also there was... Um, like, for example, when it was time for me to apply for colleges, uh, she had told me, like, I had found some, like, um, historically Black colleges that I was interested in. And when I went to um, talk to her about applying, she was like, um, no, those are bad schools. You don't want to go there. You want to apply to, like, um, these other schools, which were, like, all PWIs. And so there's these, like, small micro or maybe even macro, you know, experiences that kind of tell you, you know, like, hmm, this person, you know, has this bias and this is the way that they're interacting with me based on that bias. Um, and a lot of times, even, and I'll say this being in the field, you know, for most therapists that are master's level therapists, um, we get one diversity class in our whole program. And so oh, we wow. have to think about, right. So we think about that around, you have people who have lived experience for, you know, however many years before they enter this program and been conditioned and socialized, you know, around the normalcy of, you know, whether it's whiteness or heteronormativity or whatever. And literally, you know, they're, you know, coming into these programs, they don't have to like think differently about those things. They have one class and, you know, like college, you can get through, you know, um, yeah, you know yeah. those things without making big commitments to changing. And then now these are people that are out here doing the work, you know, working with kids, teens, adults, you know, couples, groups, and they're having been any changes for them in their own thinking and beliefs and so I think that um that is that is something I'd like to see changed as well but I do think that students and people pick up on those dynamics when you're interacting with them so for me I didn't need, I didn't talk to anyone um as a teenager and I think part of it was because like you were mentioning before mental health has been stigmatized in black communities and 
you know, to be fair, there is a history in our in our country of, you know, Black people, especially after emancipation and slavery, um, being experimenting on, experimented on, like, for psychological, you know, reasons, been thrown into mental asylums, out, like, when they were, were um, free from slavery, instead of, like, hey, do y'all need a home, or, you know, let's, right. like, get reparations, or whatever, it was just, like, let's just throw these people in a, in a solemn, because they're, like, houseless, you know? And so I think that like, these are the things that have led to a lot of stigma in community. And I don't think that our current structures are ready to contend with the realities of that. For sure. And I mean, even for American born uh, black men and women, right? Yeah. What would you honestly say, like the PTSD, you know, because if you really think about it, you know, depression is hereditary. Yes. Um. And, you know, it can be, and then it could obviously be external factors that happen. Yes. Um, when, when dealing with, uh, you know, I know you can't talk specifically about patients, but is there certain things that you pick up on that you can honestly see that is more like of a wide range PTSD? Yes, absolutely. And specifically in Black community? Yes. Oh, absolutely. So um, I, one of the ways I got introduced to this is through um, this amazing book called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome by Dr. Joy DeGruy. And the book really exemplifies how, you know, because of the experience of slavery, and I would even say colonization, um, that there's been this um, embodied trauma, you know, that's been put into the bodies of Black people. And then, of course, even if we just think about it from just like you're being beaten, you're being, um, you know, treated very inhumanely, you know, you're experiencing uh -huh. being taken away from your culture, you know, you're in one place, you're just stolen and taken to another land, you know, those experiences live in our bodies. And like you said, and then they get passed down through biology, but also through our social learning and continue to go generations and generations and generations especially when there's been no healing. And so I think that's when we get into that intergenerational trauma piece around, there's a huge community of black folks that you know have all this intergenerational trauma from these experiences and are just now, we're just now getting to the era where people are like, oh, it's okay to go talk to a therapist, you know? But we haven't right. still like addressed like all of the historical pieces that are keeping people from going. So I do think that that is a a huge um, concern, and I do see that a lot in my clients. Is that you know there'll be specific experiences like um, a good example that Dr. Joy DeGruy talks about in her book is, um, for example, um, when during the time where an enslaver would try to sexually assault you know a, a child you know. And the mother would often like talk down and degrade the child to protect the child from the slave owner. So she would say things like, oh, they're not that smart or you don't want to like talk to them, you know, just to protect that child. But if, you know, outside of that context, if parents are talking down to children in this way, you know, still using this intergenerational pattern, now it's like the child feels like I just have a negative, you know, mother who like hates me or, you know, doesn't really want to like lift me up. You know, I'm insecure, but I don't have the context for where that pattern started. And so I think that's what I've seen a lot in the room is like all of these like um, subconscious or, you know, um, unseen patterns that have just like carried forward. And my role is like, naming those and exploring those with folks and saying, you know, does this serve us, you know, anymore? And if it doesn't, let's work on um, healing it from a body level, you know, so that mm. we can fully be free and experience that healing that we're deserving of. Yeah, and, you know, that's a great point, because I always think of, I think of things, uh, this is just the way my mind works, is I have to <laughs> think of things on like, uh, the base level, right? Yes. So like you, you were saying like getting getting obviously robbed of your of your culture and, and robbed of your language. It's yes. it's almost one of those things because, you know, um, we speak English. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. that, so like that has become like, uh, you know, in a weird sense, it was forced to be our mother tongue. Yes. You know, and it's kind yes. of crazy that we kind of just all accepted that at one point mm-hmm mm -hmm, absolutely yeah you know it's just little stuff like that i'm just like oh wow it's like we're having these arguments about you know it, not some arguments but mostly discussions i would hope nowadays yes and we're speaking english and it's yes. always been something that was like damn dude like we came we came uh here from england right yeah yep. decided to keep english then we brought slaves here Yes. And then we taught them English. 
because they had to learn English. That was it. They didn't have a choice. And yep. then we made them, you know, believe in our gods and our yep. stuff. If you really think about all of that stuff, slavery wasn't that long ago in the right. in, in the spectrum of uh you know the planet. If you really yes. think about it, yes. Mm -hmm. you know, for you, is it hard to deal with? Like, damn, I wish I didn't have to speak English. That's like that's just the way. Like, I look at stuff like on a yeah. base level. It's like, damn, these motherfuckers got me. This shit sucks. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. That yes. Yeah. Accurately. And I say that because, um, like you said, I just want to really amplify what you said around slavery wasn't that long ago. Actually, my grandparents that I spent Christmas with recently, um, they talk about growing up in segregation all the time. Like they talk about those. Unreal. Right. You know, we wouldn't, you know, experience that now, but that was a reality for them. And like even um, their parents, you know, were one generation removed from slavery. And I knew my great grandparents. So it is very, you know, it's very recent you know and I would agree with you and say like I do find it a struggle that I'm speaking this language and I can't directly now I can so I will say that maybe most most black people you know we don't say oh I'm from this specific part you know and this is the exact right. within that part here's the tribal group that I was a part of and here's what language we were speaking right there's grief in that I will name that there's grief in that for me um you know I'm very blessed and privileged that I've had the experiences now where I can like do DNA testing and um, I spend a right. lot of my time doing ancestry things and so I've been able to trace it back some of my um, cultural groups back and I've been you know um, a part of relearning the language and things but think about just how much effort that is like you have to live in this society oh as gosh. kids yeah. <laughs> and then also do all of that too you know like it's an added layer of living that's just like why must I do this it shouldn't be this way just to, to piggyback off what you're saying is, you know, um, especially now, like, uh, uh, you know, I just listed off a, a ton of things of, you know, mm -hmm. historically known uh, event, American events, to put yes. it nicely. Um, yes. <laughs> you know, how do you deal with like kind of this new age, like white guilt? Yes. You <laughs> Yeah, that is, that's an amazing you know, question. <laughs> you know, you're a millennial therapist. How do you deal yes. with the millennial white guilt? <laughs> yes, this is an amazing question, actually. It's difficult because the thing that I think gets me is that there's this thing of like white people are starting to wake up and realize like their actual history, because I think there's been a, you know, an effort to hide the true history of America, you know, the legacy of everything that's occurred. And so I think, you know, now with the rise of internet and of course with 2020, I think for sure really ramped things up where white people were oh, like, yeah. oh, like these things really happened and like, oh my God, this is what racism is and white fragility, you know, like all these things, right? And what I found is then they come, a lot of folks come to black people and are like, oh, we're so sorry. And like, um, you know, well, can you help us? Can you, can you help heal us? Like, even for me as a therapist, I had a lot of um, white clients reaching out to me specifically being like, um, it's 2020. I just recognized my father was racist. And I want to process that with you in therapy. And I want you to do a lot of like the, you know, coddling me as I'm like going through this process. And so there's this, um, there's this duality there of like, how do you hold space for your experience as a Black person and everything you've went through and your people have went through? And also, like, when you're in a role like a therapist, you can't just say, I'm not going to show up and do this, you know? So, like, right. it's also... But, you, but, you, but, but to your point, though, it's like, you didn't, you didn't get, like, your master's to be, like, a Black nanny. Yeah, it, that's that part. Yes, absolutely. You, you know? That. Yes, yes, to that point, absolutely yeah. that. And that's often enforced, you know, because of that white guilt. You know, there's this, like, force of it and when you're like no I'm not doing that that's when you get all of that defense around well why not like didn't you want us to learn about racism you know like all of that yeah. you know mm -hmm. but it's almost like do you really want to do it or are you just saying because you feel like bad you yes. know everything's everything's very selfish you know what I mean yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, so like it, 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 it comes from a certain you know and I, I remember having this conversation with a couple of friends growing up and just being like I would I would ask them straight like straight out I'm like dude what's it like to be black yes mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know and they would just be like you know what I remember my, my my friend one of my friends I even have this conversation with my friends now so like for one and one we have um two guys that run it uh 
Thomas Drew and Corey Lewis. And yeah. um, they're they're both uh, both black men. And I was just like, yeah, like every once in a while, I'll ask them, I'll just, I'll like, uh, just be like, dude, what's it like to be black? Yeah. Mm-hmm, like just mm-hmm. just like help me understand the most that I can because I'll never understand. Yes. But I'm like, just like, what's it like? Yeah. You know, like I really want to hear your story and your part. And a lot of the times, you're like, you know what? No one's asking me that question. Exactly. Yeah. No one asks. You know, no like pe- asks. people aren't comfortable to ask those questions. I'm like, dude, you got. This is the only way that you can learn is by asking questions. Yes. Yes. I asked them in grade school form because that's the only way that I could process them. But like, you yeah. know, like uh, that. I feel like those are like more conversations that I hope people make. You know more normal than just being like oh i'm so sorry like that we did this exactly you know put put the time in you know ask some questions it doesn't take that it doesn't take that much to just ask a couple questions and plus especially me it's like i'm half puerto rican half italian yes um so i saw like racism within my own family and it was always something that i was very interested in in terms of just being like damn like how am I supposed to love this person when they like don't like this person yes. I've heard them say these certain things and hear these certain things and then as I got older I'm so influenced by African-American culture and you know Caribbean American culture so like there's a there's a lot of stuff there I'm like listen like I can't I can't enjoy this stuff fully if I don't really know and do some of the research of uh, whether it's a, an author an athlete a musician it's like i want to know people's like genesis and then i think that's the most beautiful part about absolutely. it is is when people want to actually put the time in and the effort absolutely that and i just you know two things to what you said the first being that um i think it's really important that you're in touch with your own culture as well like because i find too that a lot of folks will like grab onto these other things to avoid like their own you know historical yes background. yes And so I think it's really important that you're holding space for like the complexity and the nuances and the, you know, the dynamics, even within your own culture, while also saying, hey, here's a culture that has been historically oppressed and marginalized. Let's lift that up and learn more about it, you know? And so I think that's really important. And even when it comes to like, when we're talking about white people, for example, I want to just make it known that, you know, when we think about these issues that we have, like they're really white to white issues, you know, like the whole issue was that, you know, Europeans were having their own like class and, you know, other issues over there. And then because, you know, there was a lot of oppression within that, they came over and then colonized everywhere else and imported, you know, those beliefs and those values and that way of being into the bodies of so many other people. And so I think that there's this reality of like white people have to contend with other white people. And like, like you said, continue to uplift and learn more about these other groups that have been affected you know by this dynamic for sure it was it it, it was almost the white version of keeping up with the joneses yes mm-hmm. you, you, you know, that's what it, yes and then you know it's people you know people kind of make excuses like you know oh like these were the times and like this is what was happening or like you know uh human beings uh you know were animals and we have animalistic traits it's, i would always my argument would always be i've never seen a dog take a cat and make it do its job right <laughs> you know i said you know yes. we're a little you know we're, we're giving humans a little bit of a break here we're a, l- yes. we're a little more advanced than that uh because if that was it the president would be a dog you know we'd be dealing with some different circumstances here but um i wanted to pivot really quick so another thing that i'm very interested in that um uh in what you take part in and this is the reason why mm-hmm. i'm a hefty boy myself uh, mm-hmm. you know, and for me, I have a very hard time. We all just tricked you just to get a free session. Okay. Uh, so th- 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 this is how we do it. I am a comfort eater, mm-hmm. but my thing is, is I have a very hard time with portion control. Yes. Mm-hmm. How does someone start the process of maybe, is it like a weaning process Cold turkey doesn't work for me. No. In anything. In, in anything. Yes. So for someone for someone like me, who genetically, you know, uh, I, I I'm from my mother's Puerto Rican side, and they're a little more they're a little more thick on that side. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I, I I have those genes. Um, how does someone like me that struggles with portion control, or someone in the audience that struggles with portion control, do you have any tips for us? Because I feel like I could still emotionally eat, but eat the right stuff right 
I hear you. I hear you there. This is amazing. So, you know, and just for context, right? So I, within therapy, I specialize within eating disorders and disordered eating and body image, body liberation, all of those words. So um, I think that's really helpful that you've asked this question. Now, when it comes to comfort eating, I will say that I take a different approach. And so when I think about comfort eating, I think about that being, that's the food of our ancestors, right? That we've often been yes. dis from like even for you you're talking about having this italian rich background of like lots of good food puerto rican background oh, yeah. being amazing also very much yeah. influenced by black culture you know so like yes deep history right and so there's a reason why you're eating those foods because there's a connection there and so i do this thing where it's like how do I depathologize de or destigmatize my relationship with food in this way that honors that legacy and that history and also honors that like, I mean, as a part of us having hormones, like we, we have different cravings, we have different things we want, you know? And so I Tell think, me about the, it. right. We uh -huh. came back from a trip yesterday and uh, my fiance's uh, father's lasagna is outrageous. Yes. And we found out that it got destroyed on the drive. I'm an Italian American boy. Once I found out that the lasagna was destroyed, my entire day was ruined. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, like I, 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 I so I one hundred percent agree with everything you're saying. Yes. So I, I, yeah. So it's true. I need the the audience to know that this is true. It's very true. Absolutely. And I think like the questions to ask yourself would be, you know, as I'm as I'm eating this item, you know, what's happening in my body for me, and so you can start to notice like you know, is this connected to a specific emotion? Am I feeling grief? Am I feeling sadness? Am I feeling joy? And then where is the link between like, how are those things being linked? Why is this lasagna, for example, being mm. linked with, you know, um, a sad experience now that it's gone? Maybe it was happy before. Yeah. <laughs> you know and so it's true really getting into that right and and then so that's the first part with the comfort eating i said you know shifting our narrative around what comfort eating is now with the portion I'm, I'm, I'm writing i'm writing this down i'm writing this down. okay go ahead go ahead take the notes I'm writing, I'm, I, yeah I, I need them I'm, I'm gonna i'm cheating a little bit but i have to <laughs> change the eating narrative i love yes. that and then with the portion piece I would say this. So oftentimes we find, and you let me know what you let me know how you feel about this based on what you're describing. Do you have this relationship where it's almost like you feel, and I'm just using this term because I hear it a lot with clients, out of control with portions, or um, you know, as if you know, it's almost like you set out to do one thing and then you're eating more than what you planned on eating, those type of things. That and I my thing is uh my fiance calls them second dinners. Mm -hmm. Uh so I'll eat dinner. Mm -hmm. And then throughout the night, I'll know that the food is there. Yes. And it's almost like I get abducted by aliens. Like, I don't even remember the process of, like, heating it up. I do, mm -hmm. but I suppress it. Like, yes. I know I'm not supposed yes. to be eating it, so I'm suppressing it. And mm -hmm. just being like, oh, I don't know. It just happened. Like, I just ate it. Like, like it was an accident. Like, a magician, like, put the food into my stomach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? And I feel that just growing up, our portions were huge because my dad cooked for an army yes so my dad would literally like put food on the table and it was like survival of the fittest like get what yes. you can now before yes. it's all gone yes and i've never gotten rid of that eating mindset there you go and and my my father would be uh more more my mother but my father would, would hate if we didn't finish food mm -hmm. yes absolutely because because they grew up you know in a situation where my, my father, my father's father was an Italian immigrant. My mother's mother was a Puerto Rican, uh, a Puerto Rican immigrant. Um, yes. so they were like, they used to have to steal bread to survive. Absolutely. Like what well, my grandfather was around in like world war two, like watching his, like yes. his city get blown up and shit. Yes, exactly. So he used to make them finish all their food. And if they didn't, I'm sure you could guess what happens. And yes. then you, so they kind of that trickled down generationally generations to us and i feel bad if food is not finished like if i see food out it needs to be gone it's so crazy 
That makes so much sense. So you, when you're talking about it, reminded me of the study that might be helpful. So there was a study done on mice um, and it was really to examine like food relationship. And so they would starve the mice, you know, how we do experiments here, starve the mice, and then they would um, study the offspring of those mice. And so the offspring of those mice also dealt with um, malnutrition and starvation, despite never being starved. And then this passed down like two generations forward. So what you're referring to is like, you know, where you've experienced this starvation and this um, deprivation with food. And then, you know, it's just inherited, you know, generationally through like that biology. And so for you, it's like, you know, you have this meal and now you're still operating out of the trauma of your great grandfather or your grandfather and thinking like, there's not enough, even though you currently live in a state of abundance, you know, where you can probably get. Oh my God. Want. Yeah. Right. Any, any so, time of night. I'm in, New, I'm in New York, so you can get it. Oh yeah. You can literally get a newborn. <laughs> you can get a newborn baby on Postmates. It's like, exactly. If you want to. Exactly. That's just like, a- <laughs> Exactly that, right? And so that's the thing. And so I think like what it is, is this inherited pattern that's become embodied for you um, or for people that deal with this, going into the body and working with the body to, you know, create safety and release that pattern around like, we're no longer in survival mode anymore. Like your body goes into that fight, fight, freeze and letting know it's not in survival anymore and so that's one thing and just one more thing here around this is that overall like we have this culture that's really big in diet culture I don't know if you all have heard of diet culture but this culture based in friction and you know um, the slim ideal and thinness and all this stuff and because of that we you know often monitor ourselves very heavily we might restrict food we might forget to eat because we're working and all of these things and so what often happens with our bodies is that in response to any you know state of restriction we then go into the opposite side of that and might do what some people might label as overeating or binge eating you know in response to that starvation and over time you know starvation and dieting does actually lead to long-term weight gain of course the you know diet industry is not going to tell you that but you know it does right. you're restricting and then having these like um these cycles of then going into like the eating binging or overeating or just eating to nourish your body in the way it needs in that moment so yeah, yeah. it's layered for sure my thing is i'm a big fan of blood tests now yes if the blood test says i'm doing good that means yep. i could keep doing what i'm doing Yep. Now, if the blood test says I'm not doing well, then we got to change some things. I'm yes. very scientific. I'm very science based when it comes to a lot of things. So yes. I go to my doctor like every like four months, three months and get my blood taken. And then I'm like, OK, so we're doing something right. Let's stick with this. I yes. used to go to the I used to go to the doctor and say, oh, I'm good now. Now I'm going to eat whatever I want. Yes. You know, I can, mm-hmm. you, you have to keep it. And uh, again, my fiance is always like, you have to eat normal. You can't just do a crash diet because it's not going to be good for your body. And you're just going to end up where you were three months ago. And you did all that work because you wanted to do this weird diet. Exactly. If if I ate less, I'd be in a lot better shape. No pun intended. Yes. So that's like the hardest thing for me. The (laughs) other thing, too, I wanted to ask you is what's your response to people that look at uh ashley graham right and yeah. like uh and the critics of uh somebody who's uh promoting body uh positivity yeah saying that ew she's gross she's not healthy you know to go back to my point about the blood test we don't mm-hmm. know it's, it's we don't you know. know what i mean because yeah. the other thing is if you go by a bmi calculator there's guys in the nfl that are 5'9 220 yeah. and they don't have They don't have an ounce of fat on them, Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. they're obese. Mm -hmm, So like, we have to do away with the BMI calculator, mainly because it never agrees with me. And then also the BMI calculator has got it. That's got to be ancient. We shouldn't even be going by that anymore. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm really excited to talk about that. So, (laughs) so firstly, BMI was developed by this dude, this mathematician, um, and it wasn't even intended to be used through the healthcare system. It was just developed as like, as a measurement of like, you know, just like we would measure, does someone have a, you know, a long middle finger or freckles or red hair, right? Like it was like, it was like a, like a fat hypothesis. Yeah. And and the thing, (laughs) right. The thing about it is like, um, it was normed on white men during that time. And like, ne- no one ever deviated from that. And so the insurance companies, however, picked it up. Like, I think it was in 19, 
I want to say it was like in the 60s, they picked it up and they were like, oh, we can use this to, you know, raise premiums, to disqualify people from healthcare, you know, like all the things, right? Life insurance, a ton of stuff. Yeah, absolutely that. And, you know, now it's just employed where like, if you go into your doctor, you step on the scale, it's a certain level based on the BMI. And now they're just labeling you as whatever. But like you said, they don't know about, you know, what's deeper beneath, like, like, what are your actual blood markers? Or, you know, how has your mental health been this month? Or what's your levels of stress? And how is that affecting your cortisol? Or what are your hormones? Like all those things that are actually based in yeah. health. And Thyroid, social- bone Thyroid. density, yep, genetics. Bone density. Yep, absolutely. And even things like your zip code, like that basis, you know, that's based on what you have access to when it comes to food or clean water, you know, so like, those are things that folks are not thinking about when it comes to health. And so I'd like for us to really expand out what we define as healthy. And I do want to name like going back to the Ashley Graham thing, you know, we do live in a culture that is extremely fat phobic, you know, we are very much um, leaned in, um, conditioned to say thinness is better thinness is more attractive it's more desirable um and there's a book out um fearing the black body that goes more into depth with um more scientific research around how we got there um but we do live in this very fat phobic society and so when people see folks like ashley graham just living her life or lizzo um there's so many and so like when people see those folks living their life they're like oh that person's unhealthy and why are they you know i'm walking around marketing quote unquote obesity or something like that Like, you don't know this person, but you've been conditioned to view fatness as being bad and, you know, unhealthy and all this, all these things. And you immediately just associate that with this. And so I would also like for us as a culture to just get more critical about like how we make judgments or assessments about things. Well, that's the other thing too. It's like your influences are what's put in front of you, right? So, Mm -hmm. you know, if you see you know, these guys in these Marvel movies and like yeah. doing all and the rock and shit. And it's like, you know, these guys are on steroids. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, and if you got paid $20 million to go to the gym every day and didn't have to worry about anything else. And you had some dude cooking you meals to wake up at 4 a.m. to eat it. Like we'd all be straight too. you know, exactly. it's a, uh, it's kind of like what, like, you know, straight in terms of like, the ideal body you know what i mean a lot of people a lot of people don't really understand how important genetics are if i want to have a certain size like i have broad shoulders yes it would it would be hard for me to get broad shoulders if i genetically didn't have broad shoulders exactly Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know what i mean i've always had a fat butt Mm -hmm. ain't going nowhere Yep, natural you know this is just one of those things and like uh you were like you were saying before there's a lot more uh, scientific stuff. And I think it's hard, you know, especially like you said, you brought up zip codes. Like how is somebody from a low income neighborhood going to go get a body scan? Right. They're thinking about surviving. They're thinking about surviving. And then the other thing too, is I bring up genetics a lot. Yeah. If you really go back to, you know, uh, you know, to, to slavery in this country, right. My, my, I had, uh, when we were growing up, we would be like, uh, when you're kids, you go, why is everybody in the NBA black? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, and, and then we would ask ourselves that and just being like, you know, as a kid, you don't really understand because you're looking and it's like, oh my God, Michael Jordan can fly, dude. Exactly. And then, and then when you get to a certain age, you're like, oh, wait a second. Everyone out there is black. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, NFL majority of the, of the, every player on the team is black. Exactly. Yep. We have to understand that there's a direct correlation to that, to slavery and professional athletes being where they are today. Yes. And it's yes. And it's and it's the only thing that always bothered me too is like and then they're owned by like all white people and shit. So mm-hmm. it's weird. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. It, it, it's and it's just older. The older I get, the more I look at it, I'm just like, damn, like kind of got away with it again in a sense but it's like you know what i mean but we'll pay we'll pay you 40 million dollars there's there's a difference now exactly danny you're on it like i'm telling you in some ways and again not to generalize but the culture of sports to be like the new plantation right where you have these guys like you know let's just set the scene so like when we're thinking about the plantation you know a part of it too was like entertainment for white people. It was definitely a lot of the brutal work for sure, but there was also pieces around the entertainment. And so, for example, they bring 
you know, guys sit black men together, get them drunk, and then make them like fight each other. Like in that. Oh know, yeah, the uh, mandingo fighting they used to do. Yes, there we go. Yeah. The in the brew culture, right? And so that has translated now into the way that who are mostly the people consuming sports, you know, and I, I don't have the stats here in front of me, but I'm going to assume based on, you know, watching sports and going to different, you know, arenas that mostly males, you know, historically, you know, white males, you know, of yeah. course there's all races, but mostly white males are consuming these things where you have black men out on the field, throwing their bodies around. And like you said, you're getting paid $40 million, but you know, think about the impact to your body. Like you're, it's almost like they're like replaceable, you know, like once you get an injury and you're done. Oh yeah. Yeah. They'll they'll find, they're going to try and find somebody else to replace you immediately. That's how it works. Exactly that. Exactly. And so you're so right. Like that correlation and connection there is so strong. And now it's just this like, um, you know, enjoyable form of just like, yeah, this is normal. We just, you know, want this and this is okay. You know, because you want to know how it dawned on me. There was a family member of mine, I'm not going to say their name, but they were, they were mm-hmm. quite racist. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and uh, I remember I was like, oh, he was like, oh, hey, like, what's up? Like, do you want to, what are you doing next couple of days? And I was like, oh, I'm going to the Knicks game. Yeah. And he was older, older family member. And he goes, oh, the Black Circus. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I was yeah. like, what the fuck is he talking about? Yeah, exactly. And, and then like, as I got older, I was just like, oh, this is, he's looking at, from the lenses of what you're of the lens from what you're saying mm-hmm, exactly that yep and a right. lot of it starts with pwis right yes yep because they'll, yep. they'll say hey what's up man oh you can't read because whatever situation that's fine you can come play basketball you can come play basketball at this at this uh pwi yes. and you go here for a year and then, and then you know we'll get you to the league if that's how you want to do it but you got to remember, majority of these guys don't make it. The NBA, yes. there's 12 people on a team. Yep, exactly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, there's absolutely. billions of people in the world. They have people yep. from all over the world playing in the NBA now, right? So it's if you really think about it, your chances of making it are so small. Yes, yes. And it's and it's weird that we do have these institutions in place where we take like the highest caliber and then make them like compete against each other it's, exactly. It's very, exactly i mean that. i love i love sports i love sports yes. maybe it's maybe it's the white guilt talking but it's just yeah. like sometimes i have those moments i was like is anybody like really saying like the uh the uh you know the actual origins of what's going on here as long as we it, all have an understanding i'm cool with it i guess exactly that you're right and i think like here's the thing too like there's not a lot of choice like i'm really big on like you know i think that choice and agency do you know help heal trauma but here's the thing there's not a lot of choice so you know people might be familiar with the school to prison pipeline where you know that school is structured specifically towards black kids um, and i would say black males are definitely affected you know where it's like they're negated in class you know they're isolated or not paid oh yeah do all the things right and so you have this and then you're now you're in what is it 12th grade and your options are what um go to the military or go play a sport you know well that's that's like like biggie like like biggie said though it's like it's either you you sling crack rock or got a wicked jump shot and that comes from somewhere that comes from somewhere yes Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that goes back to what you said about zip codes you know it's it's uh, it's it's so crazy how everything is so connected in the universe i mean i could talk about it for hours yes mm-hmm. and then like you know they use words like and i've been guilty of this too like oh he's a specimen um yeah. he's an athletic freak you know yeah. like and then i'm just like oh, do i really want to be saying that though you know what <laughs> i mean it's because you know th- that's like the the stuff that's been ingrained in our mind because we idolize athletes yeah you know we idolize athletes we idolize actors you yes. know we idolize all of these things and then it's you, if you really peel the layers back, I'm like, like I said, I'm a big science guy. So I'm like, there's scientific reasons in evolution here that we're just kind of just bypassing over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it, 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 it always made me in a way feel like, uh, you know, that's kind of like a racist way of thinking to like be thinking about it. But I'm like, dude, it's science though. Yeah, exactly that. Right. And you know, in a sense. Yep. Yep, it is. It totally is. And it's like all of these things are so interconnected. Science, race, um, you know, all the things. Oppor- like opportunity. All- yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When it comes to 
the human body. Yeah. Is everybody different in terms of the way they digest food? Yes. Um, I Because like bellies, bellies are like snowflakes, right? Yes, exactly that. Yeah, which, yeah. Is why, which is why there's so, it's so weird to me that there's this like narrative of like, um, you know, people telling people to eat a certain way. Like when people say things like eat this many calories, like everyone should eat this many calories. Well, everybody's body's different. So like you might eat 800 calories and you're okay. But for me, I might need like 3000, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it depends. Right. And so like, just that idea that we've just standardized everything and said this is the way it goes when it's like no like listen to your body what does your body need in this moment and so like but that requires for us to slow down to check in where we're like wait is my stomach growling do I have a headache right now like you know am I feeling irritable you know those symptoms that come up when we're experiencing hunger oftentimes and I think sometimes we bypass that because we live in this fast pace, you know, we are currently under a capitalist society where we're on to the next thing, on to the next thing, doing more, doing more, doing more, being more productive. And we don't really like have a lot of training on like slowing down and being in our body and asking those questions of like, what's happening for me right now. So like, in my experience, I set alarms where I will literally have an alarm set of like, check in, have you drunk any water today? Have you had oh, a snack? That's good too. I'm a, oh, let me write that down. Go ahead, write that down. Write that down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta steal that. A lot yeah. throughout the day. I never thought about that. Because it's hard. Like when you don't do that, it's so hard to keep up with it because everything's just moving so fast. And so and I, I think... also forget. Like I'll eat. I'll eat breakfast and forget I I ate breakfast and then I'll yeah. eat again. Yep, exactly that. Right, exactly. That's a part of it. To just like go off what you're saying, it's so crazy how different everybody is. Yes, yes, everybody. You know, it, mm -hmm. Individualism is a is a big part. It's 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 really what as cliche as it is, it's what works for you works for you. Yes, it is exactly that, right? Like for you, you might be able to eat like ice cream, right? And you might be great. Me as a lactose intolerant person, it's over. You're gonna have a long <laughs> night. You're gonna have a long <laughs> night. Right. Um so uh the last one of the last this is the last question, then I have the black and embodied counseling yes. and consulting. Yes. Um, when did you start this company and yes. how have you seen it kind of grow since like 2020? So everybody remembers 2020, obviously as yeah. the, uh, the COVID, but I also see it as, uh, you know, is the year of some traumatic things happening, you know, with George Floyd and then also the rise of, of the BLM movement and, you know, uh, you know, mul multiple things going on. A lot yeah. of stuff were going down in the streets when people were not yeah. supposed to be outside in the streets. You yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. When did you start your company and how much growth have you seen in it, especially since 2020 and, you know, the, the actual George Floyd incident? How have you seen the growth in your consulting? Yeah, that's amazing. So I um, so, yeah. So before starting my company, I'll just give a brief um background. So I was working in college counseling at a university, PWI. And um, my experience of working there was I was definitely making an impact working within eating disorders, working around racial justice. However, for me, it's like um, within the institution, I wasn't able to make much change on the back end. So we've talked about so far today around like how, you know, you have, of course, like your face, your um, the things that are right there in your face, which is the, are the clients and the techniques that you use with them and how you're showing up in the room. But then you have those like more institutional and systemic things of like, well, what happens when the client leaves the room? Like, you know, who are your colleagues mm. and who's your boss and how is that working? And so I was finding I was getting a lot of pushback around trying to bring more, you know, diversity or anti-oppression into the workplace. And it became to a point where it started taking a toll on my own mental health. And so for mm. me, I decided, okay, I need to leave this environment because I can't even speak up or even, you know, share an idea without it being put down. And so I decided to leave and move into a group private practice setting, which I um, means essentially I was working at someone else's group private practice and I was a contractor there and then 2020 hit. And so I was already on Instagram posting, you know, different experiences I was having and yeah, things your page is very successful. Uh, thank you. I, thank yeah. you so much. Yes. Yes. I was posting. And again, I, at the time I didn't have many followers. I had maybe like 7,000 followers, you know, and 2020 happened. And a friend of mine actually out in LA, um, she decided like, Hey, like we've been in the eating disorders field. It's 
heavily, you know, white and we're not really being seen or heard. We both were like, you know, we talked about our experiences of that. And we said, why don't we create this movement, Amplify Melanated Voices to really, you know, highlight the ways that Black, Indigenous, people of color, brown folks, you know, where we also deserve for our voices to be at the forefront. We deserve for our issues to be mm-hmm. seen, you know, and so we created this movement and essentially what we asked folks to do was follow the pages of black, brown, indigenous, people of color creators, you know, for just this week, mute the white noise that you're usually used to hearing. Yeah, yeah. And- when you think of like anorexic, you think of like a skinny white girl. Yes, you do. Yep. Which mm-hmm. is kind of weird now that I think about it. I never really thought of it like that exactly that it's like oh she's bulimic you don't think of a person of color you think of just like some white girl in the bathroom exactly that right exactly yep yep and we were noticing that and so we said let's you know have a week only a week right only a week where you you know follow these other providers and people that are doing this work and just listen to their stories and understand a little bit more about their backgrounds and literally you know, it was right around the same time as the racial uprisings and it blew up. Like I remember I went to bed and I had the 7,000 ish followers. I woke up, my phone was going off. And next thing I know, I'm moving up 20,000, 30,000, 50,000, a hundred thousand. Whoa, what is happening? And everybody's resharing this movement and, you know, people from everywhere. I mean, I had folks from Germany and folks from Canada and the UK, everyone reaching out being like, how do we get involved in this? Is this a part of Black Lives Matters movement? How, what do we do with this, you know? And so it gave people, I think, an actionable item to do during that time. And I think it allowed us to really listen to each other and say, what do you actually need? Like, who are you as a person? What is your experience here? And I saw it across every sector, not only the eating disorders field, but people that were in like big corporations and business and like Fortune 500 companies, like saying, hey, like actually wanna, we wanna bring in more black speakers. And so for me, I noticed that during that time I was getting all these folks reaching out being like, come on my podcast, come do this consultation, right. thing, come do this panel, you know, can you do this? And I knew that I wanted to legitimize my business and that's where Black and Embody came from because, you know, I already had the page and I said, it's important for me to also have a space that's mine and also have a space for folks to come to. And so that's where Black and Embody was birthed was through that process of like, I need my own thing. And, you know, people are reaching out with opportunities and I also need to legitimize this, you know, living. Oh, for sure. That gesture. Listen, you know? I tell people, I tell people all the time, if you're good at something, never do it for free. The Joker exactly. said it very well, you exactly. know? Exactly. It's it's the truth. It's the yeah. truth. The other thing I wanted to say though too is, um, as a black woman, yes. Um, where do you think like uh, Black Lives Matter can be better? Where do you think they need, like it needs work? Are there things that you like? Things that you wish could be better in in the movement? Because the movement blew up. You know, I mean, it it took the world Mm -hmm. by storm. And now Mm -hmm. it's kind of, you know, a couple of years later after George, uh, George Floyd and, you know, many places we could be here all day talking about, you know, police injustice here. Yes. Where would you like to see Black Lives Matter, whether people like it or not, is at the forefront of, you know, uh, of social injustice. Everybody knows about it. Um, What would you like to see growth in that in that particular movement? Yeah, this is a great question. I will say that I have found that with it, when it comes to these like bigger organizations that a lot of it has been focused purely on activism. So we're so used to like historically fighting. We're always like fighting for something, you know, and that's important to fight. We should, we should continue to keep that energy, you know, of the fight. Also, I think that what we're missing is the healing. And that's where I think I come in and other folks that are doing this work is that healing work around, you can fight all day and that is important, but when you're fighting, that's having a toll on your body, you know? And so we cannot also, you know, fight the same systems and then replicate those systems within our bodies. Like the system, for example, when we're saying we want to dismantle, you know, this hyper productivity culture, we can't say that. And then also be like out here on the front lines at every single movement and not giving ourselves time to rest and recuperate, you Mm. know? And so I think about like, you know, what ways now do we start to heal our bodies and our communities? And I think the focus, you know, moving the focus into like these very structured resources around mental health, around financial, you know, wealth and, you know, accessibility and and food security and, you know, um, all of these things I think are really important for us to focus on. When it comes to the other pieces around like 
you know, addressing white supremacy and culture and things like that, that's important. But again, like I was saying earlier, those are like white on white issues to really work through, you know, as Black Lives Matter and as a community, we have to focus on what are the things within our communities that we need, like direly need right now, and right. then how yeah. do we like support those things? How do we pour our resources into those things? Well, you, you got to be the best version of yourself to fight the best yes. fight, right? Yes, you know, absolutely. It, if you look at it as a, uh, you know, if a, if a fighter goes into a fight, he's going to try, if he's a really good one, he's going to train the best that he can so he can fight the best. You yes. know, uh, you know, the, the, there's my mansplanation uh, yes. to myself yes. there. Where do you see yourself, like, not just a five-year plan of being like business. So like when I hear people say five-year plans, right, they're always talking about, oh, like my business, this and that. I'm just talking about you all encompassing you. Yeah. What 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 do you want to make of your life in the next three to five years? Absolutely. So I'm a big impact person. I feel that one action, you know, like, for example, someone listening to this podcast, they might feel validated and that might, you know, spark them to do something creative, which then influences a whole community of folks. So I'm really big into that impact work and how, like, through the work I do within myself, how is that then resonating for other folks and then coming and rippling out into the collective? And so one of the things is that I'm currently working well, finishing up a book called Reclaiming the Black Body. It is Very nice. Um, Thank you. Thank you. It's going to be huge. It's um, really based on like eating disorders and black communities and the trauma and the embodiment, all the things we've been talking about alongside unpacking the healing work as well. And so that'll be coming out, you know, in the next year. And so I'm really excited about that. And then awesome. outside of the writing work, um, I'm really also excited about, and I'm going to use this scenario to explain it. So I think when I think about my ancestors and all that they endured, I think that oftentimes people get really caught up in becoming like this black successful person, which is amazing, right? You know, you get the degrees, you get the titles, you get the certifications, you become like the big person. That's cool. But I think about, you know, what would my ancestors want most for me? What is liberation? And what would they dream of that would be like wild dreams back then? And I'm like, they would want for me to rest. You know, they would want back then they didn't have time to go to sleep. They didn't have Chilling. time. Yeah. you know chill and travel and the experience culture right and i'm like that's what i'm gonna do so these next couple years for me i plans already to go to sierra leone which is where my maternal um ancestry um has started and just visit the lands and walk and see what i feel um i'm really excited about just traveling and learning about other cultures i'm gonna start studying like seriously studying spanish so i'm excited about just those experiences and resting and so for me it's like becoming everything that my ancestors dreamed about and i think that's where we start creating a different generation of like all these liberated black folks i agree people need to chill more yes you're right <laughs> absolutely like my grandfather didn't do all like this fucking real estate work and shit for like me to keep like me to keep doing it he's just yeah. wanted me to have fun he's like yeah you know, he's like my life's miserable <laughs> so yours cannot be miserable how the fuck are you miserable you know exactly. <laughs> it's, it's the truth. This is just um, a funny question. If you had to treat one of them, mm -hmm. who would you rather treat? Kanye West, Kyrie Irving. Oh, this is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. That was yeah. a joke. But, but uh, if you if you want to answer, you can. I was just messing around. It's interesting because, like, being a therapist, I've worked with so many people, and I'm I had this sure. over like like thousands, and like male like people could say the wildest things, and I'm just sitting there like, yep, you know what I mean, like yeah. because I've just got that like lens, and so honestly, I work with both because I would be interested like how does your mind conceptualize these ideas, you know, like how did we get here? Like, and so I like knowing those things about people. So I just For like, sure. I don't start with either, you know, that sounds good. And that sounds good. And that's a very diplomatic answer. And I respect <laughs> you staying true, staying true to your title. Um, yep. And the last question is, are you happy today? I actually am like, I'm in a really great space right before the new year. Like you said, I'm, of course, like the holiday came, it took all the energy, but Recently, I've just been like relaxing and writing and being in flow. So I'm really happy right now. I love it. I stole enough of your time and enough of your uh, free treatment. But I wanted to tell you, um, <laughs> I'm so I'm so I'm so happy that you came on today. 
it was very refreshing for me to talk about a lot of these things. And, right. you know, the best thing about the show is I get to listen and, um, and, and learn so much. And for the other people, you know, who are listening to the show or watching the show, if they want to learn more about you, where can they find you on the internet? Absolutely. So you can find me at blackandembodied.com, which is my website, or on Black and Embodied on Instagram as well. And so those are the places where you can find me and be on the lookout for my upcoming book coming out next year. All right, guys, listen, you've been listening to Off the Cuff. A very, very, very special thank you again to Alicia McCullough. Thank you so much for all your help today for me. And, uh, you know, looking forward uh, to seeing you down the road, I hope. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.